We're going to get into the Word this morning. We're in First Peter, um, and I'm real excited. We're going to go verse by verse through First Peter over the next few weeks. But let me just ask a question. Uh, how are you doing? How are you doing as we shelter in place going into week five? Man, five, five weeks. It, you know, it, when they first announced this for the Bay Area counties, I, I looked back at it, and right there in the headline that said, should be over by April 7. Right. <laughs> uh, we are way past that now, and uh, we don't know when we're going to get back to normal. And, uh, you know, we don't even know what normal is going to look like when we get back to normal. Uh, things are going to be very uh, different. Uh, somebody posted this really cute uh, cartoon. Uh, uh, do you remember uh, the, the uh, Starship Enterprise? And if you remember the doors, they didn't have any doorknobs. You know, you'd walk up to a door and it would go, and people would go through. Well, this is uh, Wesley talking to Picard. And Wesley says, um, Picard, you know, wh why don't the doors have handles? And Picard answers, Wesley, it's time I tell you about the year 2020. <laughs> you know, a lot of things have changed, haven't they, since the start of this year. And I have a feeling many more things are going to change before this year is over and learning how to open doors without touching handles and washing our hands more often is the least of our worries. I mean, just try opening a plastic bag for your produce in the grocery store. I don't know if you can see the caption here, but this, uh, uh, Julie actually put this up. Um, it says, just, it says Tension, tensions are high in the produce section as someone dares to lick their fingers <laughs> to open the produce bag. But seriously, I have no doubt that many of the things we're doing to navigate through this turmoil, uh, through the dangers, the very real dangers and challenges of this year, are going to greatly affect our way of life for years to come. We are just, uh, just in the beginning of this. And how do we maintain hope in the future when we're living through very tough times and we have no idea what the future is going to bring? You know, if the virus has taught us anything, I think one thing we've learned is how our actions and our behaviors, uh, they, they don't only impact ourselves alone. Uh, we all play a part every day. We all have a part to play. We can do and impact the ways of others by sim something as simple as uh, just not washing our hands or not keeping a safe difference, distance or not wearing a face mask. You know, we also um, impact others by our attitudes. We also impact others by the way we face trials and the way we face struggles. And the question is, you know, how do we live as people of hope when times are tough? How do we shine a light in the world when the world seems to be getting darker rather than brighter? You know, Peter wrote a letter to encourage the early church in a time of struggles and a time of uncertainty. And I think that letter, 1 Peter, has a lot to say to us today. Uh, 1 Peter, it was written about 30 years after Jesus had lived and died and rose from the grave. And it was a crazy time. There were all kinds of challenges going on. Uh, one of the things going on is that persecution towards Christians was heating up. Now, Christians had been persecuted uh, for a while by Jewish authorities and leaders. In fact, Paul was one who persecuted Christians early on. And we see Peter and Silas uh, thrown in, in prison. But uh, now things are heating up. And Christians are being persecuted by Romans as well as by the Jewish community. And uh, it's not quite the terrible torture that Nero practiced, but that's happening in just a few years from when this was written. But at this time, there was distrust, there was discrimination, there was prejudice, there was disapproval of Christians. Uh, the Romans were beginning to kind of suspect Christians and, and thought they were kind of strange because everyone knew that Caesar was Lord. And these Christians were saying, well, Jesus is my Lord. And Christians were suspect because they weren't participating in a lot of the normal activities, such as 
the uh, idol worship or the ancestor worship with everybody else in the community or even in their own families. And then the Roman games, the national sport, they were so cruel and so violent that a lot of Christians said they could no longer attend the games in good conscience. Now, you know, there's a three strike and you're out thing with baseball. Baseball wasn't invented yet, but here are the big three that the Christians were coming up against. Politics, religion, and sports. You strike out on all three and you are suspect. And they were taking strong stands against national politics, the national sport, and the everyday religion of the people. In fact, Christians were accused of being atheists. Can you believe that? Because they didn't participate in the worship of idols or ancestors. Christians were seen as strange people and, and uh, just pushing the edges uh, at best. And at worst, they were seen as unpatriotic, uh, irreligious, and actually harmful to society. Wow. And this was also a time of economic turmoil. Many people were losing their homes and their family property, their land, because of heavy taxes from the Romans. Families were falling apart. And Peter writes to believers in the midst of this time, and he says that we can be people of hope even in tough times. Now, the section we're looking at today, 1 Peter 1 through 9, this is the intro to the letter, and it was the custom of the day in the introduction to talk about everything you're going to talk about. So this is kind of an overview, actually, of uh, 1 Peter. It's almost like a table of contents of the things we're going to look at uh, during the week. What's kind of interesting, as we were praying our prayer of confession today, it hadn't hit me when I was preparing, but our prayer of confession, assurance of pardon, uh, that's 1 Peter right there. That's an outline for 1 Peter. And our verses today is an outline for 1 Peter. And in, actually, and in preparing, what's really difficult is almost every word is just jam-packed with meaning in this introduction. And we could do a, you know hour-long teaching on every word uh, so uh, you better camp out for this is going to be a long one today. No, I'm just kidding. We're not going to do that. We'll come back to this stuff over the weeks, but I just want to make some brief comments on every verse today because this is where we're going to be going together as we find out how to live with hope and be hope-filled, hopeful people in tough times. So let's get to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. And I'm going to be using the New American Standard Bible, but use whatever Bible you have in your home or on your phone or your laptop. And let's pray. Lord, as we get into deep, Peter, uh, in deep into 1 Peter, Lord, and we dig deep, I pray that you would open our hearts, our minds for what you have for us. Help us to see the parallels uh, of how, what they lived through back in that day and what we are living through today. And help us to grow and to uh, thrive and to be people of hope, Lord, even in hard times. Amen. So Peter, he introduces himself. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who reside as aliens scattered through Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, uh, res reside as aliens. Uh, some other translations may say maybe you have lived as strangers or exiles or sojourners. You know, as followers of Jesus, uh, we are in this world, but we are not of this world. Uh, we live on the planet. We have citizenship in whatever country we live in or town that we live in, whether it be Fremont or Union City or Niles or Pontus or Galatia or Cappadocia or Bithynia. Uh, we, we have citizenship there, but we have dual citizenship. We also are citizens of the kingdom of heaven. Someone once said, the world is a bridge. The wise man will pass over it, but he will not build his house on it. Uh, Hebrews says that for we for here we do not have a lasting city, but we are seeking the city which is to come. So one key, one just basic understanding of being hope-filled and hopeful 
in tough times is to realize our hopes are not based on the things of this world. Our hopes are based in our Lord Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God. Who are chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father by the sanctifying work of the Spirit to obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood. Man, there is just so much here uh, and, and at the same time, this would be a kind of verse that you w- might just you know, slough over. It's, oh yeah, God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, move right, moving right along. But Peter brings this up for a reason, and he's going to come back to this again and again. And notice he talks about the work of the Father and the Spirit and the Son. The Father chooses. The Father chooses. You are chosen by the Father for such a time as this. And we need to remember that in hard times. Uh, It's not a fluke. It's not an accident. God chose you to be his son. God chose you to be his daughter. And you are here now in 2020 going through this crisis to share the goodness and love of God, to be a beacon of light as you live as a citizen of two worlds with the Holy Spirit sanctifying you. Now, sanctifying is a fancy word for growing you up, maturing you, actually teaching you the ways of holiness. And holiness is a big theme in First Peter. Now, holiness, that word might scare you a little bit, but uh, you are holy. We just sang about God, you are holy, holy, holy. Yeah, and if God is holy, we're his kids, we're to be holy too. So we're going to talk about what that means and how the Spirit is doing that in our lives Chosen by the Father, sanctified by the Spirit, that you might what? Obey. To obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood. Now, after Easter Sunday, Jesus taught the disciples and appeared many times for a period of days. And then he appeared to them one last time before he went up to be in heaven. It's called the Ascension. And Jesus' last words were, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. It's interesting, the word obey. I, I, I have a feeling, even though we read that verse, and many of us have probably memorized that verse, I think in our minds we substitute believe for obey. I think in our practice, we're always thinking, we've got to teach them to believe, teach them to believe. But that's, not, I mean, believing is part of it, right? But what does Jesus, Jesus emphasize? Teaching them to obey. And here we're told that um, we're to obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood. Back in the book of Exodus, there's a lot of sprinkling of blood. And there's one time where uh, Moses uh, does a sacrifice and he sprinkles half the blood on the altar and half the blood on the people. And the sprinkling of blood on the people was a sign or um, an image or a type of blessing that they would obey so that they would obey the, the covenant that they're entering into with God and each other. Uh, there's another time when blood is put across the doorpost on Passover, and that's the blood of salvation. So there's believing, there's being saved, and there's oh. Obeying, and we're going to hear about the importance of being doers of the word, not just hearers only, as we go through uh, First Peter together. May gre- grace and peace be yours in the fullest measure. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace. Uh, we see that in so many of the letters of Paul and. Uh, here, they are, here it is in Peter's writings. You know, grace and peace. We've got the gospel in two words. Uh, the grace and mercy of God in Christ and the peace that we're called to with God and with our brothers and sisters and with our neighbors. Uh, grace and peace be yours in full measure. You know, this is the promise that Peter wants us to hear loud and clear in tough times. If we're to maintain, uh, not just survive, but thrive and live as hopeful people in tough times, 
Don't let those tough times rob you of grace and peace because it's available. It's, it's not running short. Now, there's things uh, on the shelves that are empty in the store, but I'm telling you, God's not running out of grace and peace. It is in full abundance, it fullest measure. It is overflowing. It is shaken out. It is running out all over, even in hard and tough times. Even when things are far from normal and you feel like a stranger in a strange land. I saw a post by a friend the other day. It said, uh, I wish this Twilight Zone episode was over. <laughs> you ever you feel like you're in the Twilight Zone? Well, grace and peace can be yours in fullest measure, even in the Twilight Zone. Who, according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Uh, This is actually, this verse is why I got attracted to going through 1 Peter right now. This is uh, the after Easter story, isn't it? You know, on Easter morning, the two Marys, they went to the graveyard. They went to anoint Jesus' body. And what did they found, find? They found the tomb was empty. The stone was rolled away. The tomb was empty. And the angel asked them, why do you seek the living among the dead? Why do you seek the living among the dead? Hey, we do not hope in a dead person. We do not hope in a dead religion. You know, so many religions, so many philosophies, so many isms and ologies out there They hope in someone who's dead. They hope in the words of someone who lived and died a long time ago, left some writings or some teachers, and they follow that dead person and those dead writings, hoping, hoping that they were right. Well, one reason we know Jesus is right is that Jesus is not dead. He rose from that grave. He is still alive. And the promise for us, we're we're born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. What God did for Jesus, raised him from the dead, God does for us too. Even today, we are born anew into a new hope. Now, we haven't seen all of it yet because we're not in the new heaven and the new earth. But we are born again, we are resurrected, made alive today in Christ, and we will be raised on the last day with him. So we are hopeful, not in this world, but we are hopeful in the things of God that never perish. And that's what Peter talks about. To obtain an inheritance, listen to this, which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved for you in heaven. An inheritance, an inheritance. Now, in all throughout the Old Testament, we hear about the promised land. And when you read about the promised land, if you go back there and look, it's often called an inheritance. And Peter's letting us know that that was a type. The promised land was a picture of the true promised land, the promised land that is to come that's imperishable, undefiled, and will not fade away. You know, Jesus said... And actually, what's interesting is you go through 1 Peter, you find, yeah, Peter listened to Jesus. As, as stubborn as Peter was at time, uh, we see that stuff really sunk in to him. I mean, just think about this verse in connection with Jesus saying that um, we, are to put, we are to invest our treasure in heaven, a treasure where moth and rust cannot destroy, that's imperishable, undefiled, never failing, never fading. You know, stock, the stock market's going to rise and fall. Your health is going to come and go. One day, the house that you live in and take care of is going to fall apart. Uh, we're finding out now that insurance companies, they're going to fail to pay. But you have an inheritance which is imperishable, undefiled, will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed at the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, even though 
Now, for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials. Wow. Can we truly rejoice when we're distressed by various trials? I mean, is this for real, what Peter's talking about? Or is it just uh, smoke and mirrors? Is it like just uh, stiff upper lip, put up a good front, say on the positive end of things, see the glass is half, you know, full, not half empty, you know? Is that what Peter's talking about? I think he's talking about more than that. And, and this is actually, this is the heart of the letter right here, is um, how do we rejoice while we're being distressed by various trials? And we're going to dig deeper in this with just a little hint. Peter gives us a hint of where he's going by two words, little while, if necessary. That's his hint about what he's going to talk about with trials. Peter's going to talk about how trials don't last forever. Tough times don't last forever. Honestly, though, truthfully, when you're in it, when you're in the trial, especially if it's a trial where there's great pain, great emotional pain or physical pain or spiritual pain, uh, doesn't it seem like forever? It does seem like forever when you're in it. But Peter is contrasting tough times in this life with a life forever with God and reminds us and wants us to get this down as painful as the tough time might be. It's for a short duration compared with eternity. Tough times will pass. God is forever. So that the proof of your faith being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire. Being tested by fire. It's going to come up again in this letter. But let us just say today, that Peter knows from his own life, he knows from his experience uh, about being tested and going through hard times, and he has hard times he will go through in the future, if you know the story of his life and the prophecy Jesus prophesies about him at the end of the Gospel of John. Um, And Peter has discovered that our loving Heavenly Father can use even hard times to grow goodness and faith and hope in our lives to mature us, just like fire refines precious gold. But on the other hand, Peter also knows that Satan, our enemy, would take advantage of those same hard times to harden us, trip us up, break us down, and destroy us. Somebody said, tough times can make us better, or tough times can make us bitter. As we go through Peter's letter, we're going to find out about how tough times are times when we can grow and we can thrive and we can actually mature in our faith. And I'm missing a slide, so I'll just read it. Next verse. May be found in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him. Uh, This is another uh, key verse for 1 Peter. You remember he's writing 30 years after Jesus rose from the dead. And many of those who saw Jesus in the flesh, they they have actually died. And uh, Peter and Paul will soon be martyred. And a question that's going on for Peter and for the other apostles is actually, what is the new normal for the church? Uh, What will the church be like when the 12 are gone? When those who saw Jesus and walked with Jesus and sat at his feet have all died and gone to glory? What will happen to the church? Will church be possible? Well, Well, we know. I mean, here we are, 2,000 years later. We're, we're still here, aren't we? Or are we still here? Yes, we're still here. But the question we're asking is, what's the new normal from the ch- for the church? Can the church survive if we don't meet in the church? Well, I think we're doing pretty well. In fact, I hear reports from pastors I've been talking to that uh, they've got more people attending worship and going back and listening to the sermons online than ever 
before that uh, I was just talking to one of the pastors in our classes. He said their, their attendance has increased dramatically since this all happened. It's just, just awesome. Um, somebody said last week, oh my goodness, the church was empty on Easter morning. But then they paused and said, well, but then again, the tomb was empty on Easter morning too. And that wasn't a bad thing. So Peter's bringing it home. He's saying, you've never seen Jesus like I've seen Jesus. But Peter says, you know him and love him and believe in him. We are scattered. We are exiled to our own homes right now. But we are gathered in the Spirit, and we can still shine his light. Verse goes on to say, you greatly rejoice with inexpressible and with joy inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. The word outcome in some of your Bibles may be goal, it may say purpose, the goal of your faith or the purpose of your faith, the salvation of your souls. And isn't that what it's really all about? Peter's reminding us of the goal, keeping our eye on the prize. It's not about the building. It's not about 9.30 Sunday morning. Those are just tools. Those are methods. Those are wineskins. It's about the salvation of souls. And you know what? No virus, no shutdown can stop that. And so I want to encourage you, uh, read over the verses we looked at this morning. Read over 1 Peter 1, 1 through 9. And if you have time, actually read ahead. Read the whole letter. And start thinking on what is Peter saying about life and following Jesus and keeping hope in tough times. And there's five words that appeared in our reading today that I've kind of spoken about, but I encourage you to go back and find them and highlight them. And they're words you're going to be familiar with, but it's just amazing how they come up in these these nine verses. Grace, peace, probably could find those pretty easy, but look back through and find hope faith, and love. These five words are a big part of navigating tough times and living as strangers in a strange land.